Hello everybody and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name is Gary Williams and today I'm joined by one of the most expert minds on cabaret, certainly in London right now, Mark Shenton. Hello Mark, welcome to Cabaret Secrets. Hello Gary. Um, just by the fact that the amount of cabaret that you have seen and see all the time must make you something of an expert. I know you wince at me saying that, but you, you've, you must have seen quite a lot of cabaret. I have. I mean, unfortunately, there's not enough of it really in London, although it's burgeoning at the moment, thank God, thanks to rooms like Crazy Cox at uh, Brazil Wizard Alp in particular. The Hippodrome has unfortunately come and sort of gone already. Um, but of course, it, it's a vacuum that's constantly filled. So thankfully, there is quite a lot of it about at the moment. But, um, I mean, usually this time of year, June, I like to go to Australia for the, for the Cabaret Festival in Adelaide, which is an amazing... I did that three, four years running. Mm. Um, and I'm feeling a real pull at the moment towards that. Barb Younger's out there. And Barb, I got her uh, programmed for, to one of the festivals a few years ago. Um, and uh, I, we were there together. It was fantastic. Um, so I, I was, do see a lot of... Cabaret. I was going to come on to this later on, but I have to mention it now, since you've mentioned Adelaide. The worst review I ever had was by you on a show that I did in Adelaide at the Cabaret Festival. And so it brings us nicely on. <laughs> I've embarrassed you. Do you remember anything about this? Does this ring any bells now? Um, it is ringing bells. And I, but the thing about writing reviews, and I write a lot of them, <laughs> is you can't... You will remember my review better than I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've, I've, I've never a day goes by. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and by the same token, by the same token, um, uh, I recently reviewed Liz Robertson at Crazy Cox, um, and she sent me the sweetest message on Facebook afterwards, saying that it's a meth it's a it's a review she's going to carry with her whenever she's feeling a bit down. She'll read it and reassure herself that all is well. Now, on the other hand, I can see <laughs> the the impact that a bad review will have on somebody and of course you write them I mean I have to say I always write reviews with the, with the, with the, with the most honest heart yes. I mean I, I try not to to be brutal and unkind although I, I, I you'll have I to remind you momentarily yes, what yes, you said yes um, <laughs> but um, um, the thing is you have to speak with with, with, uh, with your own heart and what's honest to you mm. um, and stand by what you say I mean I, I'm afraid you know you're here now in my lounge and of course um, and, I, and I, since then I've grown to like your work um, but but um, <laughs> I can't put myself back to Gadley. The I reason, can't remember I, the, what the I, said. reason I mention it, it's, it, it is interesting. First of all, it's quite funny uh, that I'm here now, but it, it's interesting because um, I'll explain for you if you don't remember and for anybody listening to this what happened. I'd been working, my, I consider my area of expertise to be cabaret, to be working a small room or an intimate thing. I, this is sort of what I do. Uh, but as you will know, for quite some time, I was working with the John Wilson Orchestra and we worked together for many years all over the place doing these concerts. And and we were opening the Cabaret Festival in grand style with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra and John conducting. And they said, we, I, we got out there and there's this huge amount of space all around the front for me to work. And I said to John, what do you want me to do? Because there's all this space I need to use. It's going to look weird if I'm standing back with you. And he said, no, 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 just do what we always do. Mm. And I read your review and I, the bit that I remember about your review, and it was a great line. It said, this was a case of the bland leading the band. <laughs> oh, ouch, ouch. That's good, right? Ouch. But you know what? You were absolutely right. And I didn't have any problem with... I would have thought the same thing. I was aware of that when I was doing it. Actually, it was a, a, a perfectly uh, fair observation. I suppose this must happen a lot where the performers, particularly in a musical theatre show, mm. that or in a movie, that the, the, the talent, the actors, the singers, the dancers, are being directed, aren't they? Or they're, having, they're given words to say, not their absolutely. own. But so they get it in the neck if it, if it's, if it doesn't work. Because they're the one on the front line, absolutely. I mean, what we, one tries to do, and perhaps now, a few years old, maybe I wouldn't be quite so brutal. It was um, a good line, though. It was a good line. I'd be proud of that if I'd written that. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, where do you blame? Where, where do you put responsibility? And, of course, a critic goes in uh, and doesn't know what your history is with the show and yeah. the orchestra you just review what the night you're seeing yeah um so i'm not defending myself because i am um, but at the same time um you know i, I was saying what i what i thought of that night and it was I, I, absolutely now, um, now what i do think is great is i do think it's wonderful or that, 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 that 
in a way, you recognise that that's the way it might have come across. You didn't sort of blame me for, for feeling mm -hmm. that. And that's great because um, I, I recently had the producer of Viva Forever, which, as you know, has been a monumental flop in the West End. Mm -hmm. She also produced uh, Mamma Mia. Um, and she's somebody I, I respect hugely and, and actually admire and, and I love. I'm a big fan of Mamma Mia. But Viva Forever, I could not, with all good conscience, mm -hmm. uh, embrace. Um, and when I reviewed it unfavorably, as did most of my colleagues, I have mm -hmm. to say, um, I found it quite, you know, scary but I but because I didn't really want to lay the put the boot in but you know I don't want people to spend 60 pounds or more seeing this pile of rubbish um so I kind of said, said what I thought and I then ran into her the first night and the first time I'd seen her since 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 the review had appeared and she came up to me and said um um uh, I I'm going to have to cut off your willy. And, she, and I said, why is that? And Maybe she, she used said, different words, did yeah. she? No, she used exactly oh, those, those words. words. That was yes, quite those polite. Words. Yes, a polite word. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I said, why is that? She said, well, when I read your review, I cried. And, of course, that's very emotional language she's using. Um, and, and it makes positions designed to make me feel bad and and indeed i did feel momentarily bad but i did say to her as well, well I, I i wept for two hours watching it well, I, I wanted to say that but i didn't <laughs> I, what i did say was you know i'm afraid it's my job and i have to speak speak what i the way i find it and she said yes but we're we're we're, we're all in the theater business together we should stick together mm. <laughs> and and somebody i wrote about this on my blog and and somebody posted a, a response in which they said yes and friends tell each other the truth oh that's good um, isn't it? which is also true very true yeah. so i mean yes i think critics have a lot of responsibility because our words can cut deep and can indeed have commercial impact i mean the movie forever has not run i don't think because of us i think despite you know it wouldn't have run anyway because yes. the audi audiences can sniff out a failure yes. um, and they wouldn't have gone to that anyway and by the same token critics can give shows great reviews and they, they still fail yeah. um so i don't think we take entire responsibility but i do think um you know we're only part of the picture we're one voice among many yeah yeah i read on your blog the other day actually lloyd Evans of The Spectator. Uh, you mentioned that because, uh, well, there'd been a considerable difference of opinion. Yes, in, in his case, so he'd, he'd reviewed um, a couple of shows that he couldn't believe that other, that other critics had liked. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I always say that in the critical fraternity, there is no right and wrong. It's always a matter of opinion. And you always stick by some, what you know, you follow a critic who, whose opinions you respect. And, and sort of generally share. And generally thing, share, yeah, a value system that you mm -hmm. share. So, for instance, I mean, I, I always hold by what uh, Michael Billington says in The Guardian in particular, for, for plays, not for musicals so much, because he doesn't really know his musicals, but for plays, I mean, he's... he's I love like, we've got a reviewer reviewing a reviewer. Well, yes, indeed, indeed. It's <laughs> very meta, isn't it? <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, you follow critics that you, that you admire, and I think I think Michael is one of the, you know, the gods of us all. I mean, he's, you know, he's been in the business for... He's been writing reviews for n nearly as long as we've both been alive. I mean, he's been writing for The Guardian for 40-something years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and he's a considerable man with, with, with a lot of expertise and I think that's what you go for as a critic is critics at least have expertise and we've been around, We, as you started off by saying with me I've seen a lot, um, whether or not that means I see things differently is another question, or whether I see things accurately but I do think I've earned the right a bit to be here, I've done my homework and I do my homework, I still keep going, I go mm -hmm. all the time um, and and also I'm insatiably curious, I love I, I'm out there all the time, I want to and I want things to be brilliant, yes, I always yes. want things to brilliant i mean I, it's a passion i love this, this what i do um and of course so therefore it's even harder when i don't love what i do yeah. i have to say by the way just to go back to the la cabaret festival the, one of the problems of the festivals in particular is they set you up to see too much so you see an awful lot in an awful a very short time and things do um uh, they, they can benefit from that but they can i mean i've made many discoveries at adelaide and were, uh, i first saw tim minchin in a tiny room in adelaide wow. um um you know a, a room no big not much bigger than, this, than my lounge mm. um performing um his weird piano mm. act there mm. um in barefoot and and that weird hair and and you know since then i've gotten to know him very well because he's now a london composer mm -hmm. of matilda and so on but seeing tim minchin at the start of his career there was amazing Great. and there's another guy called Eddie Perfect who is a, a brilliant brilliant Australian um, singer actor who uh, recently did South Pacific at the, at the Sydney Opera House um, uh, but I also saw him at Adelaide Cabaret Festival first and this was a boy I thought is destined for stardom he's a bit of a star in Australia but he's never quite made the, made the crossover yet mm -hmm. over here how do we get you to review our shows? The, the, the truth is there aren't enough hours in the day or nights in the week, in particular nights in the week. Um, I mean, I'm at the theatre, I would say, 
at least six out of seven nights, if not seven nights of the week. Um, uh, I have to say my partner doesn't always approve of this because um, <laughs> I'm never at home. Um, um, but um, I mean, I, you know, the, I just there's too much to see and I can't fit it all in. And I do like to see it all. And I'm, I play as musicals, cabaret the lot. So how do we get, how does one so, get to the top of your list? That's incredibly hard. I mean, you, it, it's all a question of what else is on. I mean, just for instance, today, um, I'm going to see a play at the National tonight that opens at 7 o'clock, and then I'm sneaking in to a late-night uh, cabaret, purely for pleasure, Amanda McBroom at Caf- uh, Crazy Cox. Mm. Amanda McBroom is, I think, one of the great singer-songwriters of our time. Uh, I've seen her over the years many, many times, the, the late, great Peter on the Park. Um, well, I used to see her there. I saw her there several times, and I, and I adore her work. Um, so the only only slot I could see her is tonight 10.30, mm. which is going to give me a bit of a late night, But mm. and I'm not really a late night bird, mm. sort of strangely enough. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, late night shows are actually are quite a good way of getting me in mm. on, on a weekend, not on a school night when I've got mm. work the next day, as mm. it were. Mm. Um, but um, it, w- also what I would say is perseverance, because um, it, I may not be able to come each time you ask me, but if you just keep asking me, I will come eventually. Mm. Um, I don't mind being pestered. Um, I heard a thing about polite persistence yes, pays. Yes, exactly. As long as, as long as you, know, you don't mind me saying no, I don't mind you asking. Yes. Um, and presumably and, it starts with actually having something decent to, for you to come and watch, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and also going to a really good venue. I mean, you know, the St. J- um, right now I'm a big fan of the St. James Studio at, at uh, St. James's in Victoria. Um, if you appear there, that will be an incentive for me to come because I love the venue now. Mm. Um, That's a good tip for people listening <laughs> yeah, to this, isn't yeah. it? They're, they're going to be inundated now with people <laughs> wanting to perform there. I mean, also, I, the Pheasantry is also a ter- terrific venue. I mean, I, but you know what? I still miss Pete in the Park. Badly. Me too, me too. Because Pete in the Park was... Just it, had something, it, didn't it? 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 really was. It was actually the first cabaret room that I ever experienced in my life. It's me where, too. It's, it's, where I, it's where my love for cabaret was formed. Yeah. But also, it, there was something about the, the dimensions of the room were perfect. Mm. Um, I mean, I'd never, ever wanted to see the room, particularly with the light on because I'm sure that it was you didn't want to look in the corners yeah, yeah, yeah. but there was something really elegant and simple and sight lines were great in most mm-hmm. seats mm-hmm. um um, the pizzas, if they arrived warm, were fine. Hot were fine, but if, but if they didn't, they you, you know they could often were made upstairs and left waiting for ages. But that wasn't the point. The point was there were some great, great acts there as well in the early days. I mean, that's where I first saw Anne Hampton Calloway, who I think is the cabaret goddess of all of every of them mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. I also saw everybody from you know Linnea Montevecchi to um, Karen Akers to um, uh, 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 my first was Andrea Markovici, Andrea Markovici that I saw there, and oh. I was just spellbound. Well, Andrea. Mark- Markovici is, is one of those great paradoxes of cabaret because she's the perfect cabaret artist in the sense that she she's brilliant at the patter. She, her stories are amazing. She has one of the one of the scariest voices of in, in musical cabaret. I mean, it's not it's not a musical sound at all. She's not very pleasant to listen to. Mm. Um, you don't want to spend hours listening to her. But I love seeing her. Well, that, that, there are I think there are a lot of cabaret people that are successful in cabaret. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to buy their album and listen to it over dinner or listen yeah. to it in the car. But God, oh my God, you really want to go. Elaine Stritch, for example. I, I wouldn't want to put on an Elaine Stritch album and, and just for listening pleasure, no. but electrifying live. Indeed, her stage show, that the last, that the one that she brought to the Old Vic, the uh, Liberty. Uh, Stritch, Liberty, is one of the great theatre shows of our time. I'm I mean, glad you said that. Oh, I agree. God. I, I, that, you know, that show, because it, it's so brilliantly constructed, the stories in it and the way she told them yeah, was so yeah. unique. I mean, it's all, thank God it's been collected, uh, saved on a video yeah, forever, yeah. Um, which is fantastic. Because, you know, she's now retired. She just recently gave her last show at the Car- Carlisle, and she's given, it's all finished now. Uh, and actually, towards the end, she wasn't able to remember things, so it was quite, quite, quite difficult. I mean, she's eighty six, eighty seven, but you know, Barbara Cook may long, may she long thrive, has turned eighty, eighty five now. So you know, it's uh, it, it does. You don't have to stop just because. But of it's age. interesting that um, people think, particularly coming into cabaret, they think that uh, the 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 most important aspect of being a cabaret singer is to be a good singer, but it's not, is it? There's much more to it than that. No, it's it's too cabaret for me is an expression of of not of the not so much of the song but of the person through the song. So you are revealing yourself in song, and the song is just a medium to, for, for it. Um, and there isn't. I mean, I was I, I, I said Anne Hampton Calloway is the cabaret goddess. The greatest singer of my of my lifetime is Barbara Cook, um, and um, she. Um, 
she's just extraordinary because she makes an entire room, no matter what it is, and I've seen her in tiny rooms. I've seen her uh, at Feinstein's in New York, say, which is a small room, uh, all the way up to the Metropolitan Opera House. And she'll make you feel like she's singing to you alone. Um, and it, it's a lifetime of experience in, in, in a voice. Um, and, you know, the, te- the instrument is, is it's a brilliant instrument that she's got. She seems to have it all, doesn't she? She, she really does. Um, um, you know, there's this, there's this radiating warmth about her, 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 her being, um, which, of course, is partly act- an, an acting role because, you know, she, she's... It's all showbiz. It's all showbiz, yeah. Um, but but she, she is fantastic. She she absolutely communicates through song, um, and the voice has has stayed constant. I mean, it's as it's as bright and brilliant. Maybe the top note she can't do anymore, but but she still sings beautifully, mm. and it's reaching an audience through song. I mean, she feels she feels the song, mm. um, and of course, I, I don't think you can teach that particularly or learn that particularly. It's an empathy, isn't it? Yeah, um, and it's just her spirit as a human being, yes, um, yes. which is an indefinable, really. Well, it's interesting to talk about that because when uh, one of the questions I asked in the book is, or what I addressed, is can anybody do cabaret? And I... I, I struggled with this, and I, I, I invited other people to comment on this in the book, and because I sort of started out thinking, yes, anybody can do a cabaret. Uh, I mean, you can teach somebody how to sing, and you can teach somebody, you know, how to do some uh, chat, how to structure a show, how to give it a theme. You can somebody can help you pick the right songs. You can find a good arranger, and so on. And then it comes down to this thing we call the X factor. And what is the X factor? And trying to define that was was quite uh, tricky. But for me, it comes down to uh, charisma um, or a a, a personality, a charm. And I don't think you can really um, fake that, Uh, only to a degree on stage. Of course, we are all acting. And when I do my show, uh, I've got my patter, there's this bit that I do, or I might tell this anecdote, and it's always the same. It's sort of become quite crafted over the years. And so, of course, it's a, the trick is to make it look like it's the first time that you're, you're telling it. So there's, there's an yeah. acting thing there. But still, there's a, there's a sort of... A, some, there needs to be something real and sincere that you've got a genuine love. And I, I, I don't think... I might be wrong, but I don't think you can bullshit that, really. No, exactly. And, you know, we spoke about Andrea Malkovici. Andrea Malkovici... She and Michael Feinstein actually, as well, I think is another example of of they're, they're both musical theatre historians or historians of the so, of popular song mm. that that craft. The, I mean, Michael in particular, he knows he's got he knows every song ever written. Yeah. Um, um, but you know, Andrea crafts her shows around w- diligent research, and it's not it's not fake. She's really interested in this. Yes, it's, yes. It's, you know, so the passion comes through. The passion isn't through. It? There's nothing worse than an artist who who haphazardly introduces a song and then gets the composer's name wrong or something because no, no, they completely they, lose their credibility yeah, yeah, exactly though. it's all about credibility and um you know i mean michael Feinstein again not the best instrument in the world it's it's, it's not a great voice um but but there is something about the fact his love of this material that makes him and his charm remarkable yeah. so charming and yeah. such a warmth on stage yeah, yes absolutely i mean cabaret has is sadly has a very pejorative ter- um, term often thanks particularly to simon cowell who will say to people yes, that you're very cabaret or um, very cruise ship which also drives yes, me mad yeah um, I mean, the thing is that there is no set definition of it. And, of course, nowadays um, there's this whole movement with burlesque, particularly, that's, that's come into cabaret. Yeah. And, indeed, the Hippodrome, sadly, I think has been, is going more towards burlesque mm-hmm. than it is towards what I th- term as cabaret. Cabaret, for me, is a singer and a song, for me. Um, and it's a singer and a song in an intimate environment. Um, but, but, of course, you know, comedy acts are also cabaret. It, it, it's, it's an eclectic term. Um, I, I, try and, I try to avoid the fact that... I mean, I know some people, Barb Younger, for me, for instance, has told me often that she tries to resist the term cabaret. She doesn't like to be called a jazz singer either. It's a pragmatic art, I think. You play wherever, wherever, yes. wherever. Yeah. Well, if, 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 if you can, if somebody wants to listen to you in a cruise ship or wants to listen to you at the Met, you go and play there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, what I, you know, I love the fact that, that, that um, uh, you know, Audra McDonald, for instance, who, who mm-hmm. is my other great voice at the moment, I mean, in terms of Broadway theatre voices, um, you know, she's, she's appeared at the, I've seen her at Carnegie Hall, I've seen her at the Met, um, um, she's also this summer. I'll be seeing her in a two hundred seater theatre in Provincetown. Mm-hmm. She, you know, she'll, she'll, she goes wherever people want to hear her great. sing. That's and great. that, I suppose, that's ultimately what cabaret is. Cabaret is taking the songs with you because it's a very transportable skill. Um, you know, you don't you don't have to have elaborate sets and costumes. You just need a piano and and, and a stage and a mic. Mm-hmm. You don't even need a mic. You can sing a cappella. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, 
and it, you know you, you can just turn up and sing and that's what that's for me that's what definition of cabaret is yeah do you think musical theater singers make good cabaret singers um Musical theatre actors are very used to um, being directed. They're very used to go following scripts. Um, they're not... They're, and hiding behind a character. They don't feel comfortable, particularly often, as cabaret performers. Um, they, they, bringing down the fourth wall and, and stepping out as themselves is not a, 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 something they feel terribly comfortable with. I once asked Elaine Page to do, if she would do cabaret, and she didn't want to. She can do concert work, because there's a, there's, 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 a, there's a division, but cabaret is too intimate. Uh, I asked Junior McKenzie once to do cabaret. Um, uh, to, to, just to rewind, um, I, I, I programmed the initial Divas of the Donmar season. It was my idea for the Donmar to do that season. That was you. That was me. And that was and, Michael Ball took part um, in that, didn't Michael Ball took part in one year, yes. Um, um, uh, although my first year was, uh, the, year, the, the year I set it up, we had um, Barbara Cook, of course. Um, but, but no. <laughs> Top of your list. Yes. Um, but um, or, Anne Hampton Calloway and Liz Calloway mm-hmm. um, coming together to do their, 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 their sibling revelry show. Mm-hmm. And, and this was my master stroke, actually, was Imelda Staunton um, doing her cabaret show, which she'd never done before. Mm-hmm. Well, she actually had done a big band show at the Talk of London at, at the New New London Theatre, mm. um, and uh, and then she came to the Donmar to do it. And of course, she'd already done a play at the Donmar, Habeas Corpus, directed by Sam Mendes. So she was very much up for it. But the weird, weird, and some weird and wonderful story is that I had actually asked Julie McKenzie first to do it because I thought she's the person I would love to see in cabaret. I, the day she called me to say, oh, "I really can't do cabaret; it's just too scary for me," uh, I thought, "What am I going to do?" And I was on my way to the Donmar for a meeting, and I walked into the late lamented address circle on the way. And there was Imelda, and I introduced myself to her and, and said, I'm doing the season of the Doma, the of the Cap, the of the Doma, would you like to be one of them? And as she said in a programme note, and it all happened because I met a man in a shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are some musical theatre performers who, can, who, who make the, 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 the crossover brilliantly to cabaret. Actually, one of my favourite cabaret acts of all time, um, uh, one of the, one of the nights, nights in the theatre that just resonated more than any, was as part of the Divas of the Doma season. Philip Quast um, oh, did, yeah. did a, a, a week. Week. Um, and in fact, there's, a, there's an album of that week um, out, um, which is pr- truly wonderful. This was a man who was, you know, we knew him from musicals. He's won three Olivier Awards for musicals. Um, he he also acts in plays in Shakespeare. Um, sadly, he's now moved back home to Australia, but so we're not going to see him here. Um, but he um, he did his week at the Donma, and it was, it was a personal journey through his life, through song. It was remarkable. Mm. Um, and you can still, as I say, you can still get the album to hear how brilliant it was. Mm. Um, and I remember coming out of that evening, and I went went twice that week, because I just had to see it one more time. Um, but I remember coming out and thinking... I think this man is the best person in musical theatre today. Mm. And that was because of a cabaret show. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's actually quite surprising that there are any musical theatre experts that can adapt to yes, the cabaret yes. role because it must feel to them that they're putting on a different hat. It's true, it's true. And it's, it's very interesting, isn't it, that Barbara Cook, who grew up as a Broadway ingenue in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s, um, by the early 70s, her musical theatre career was finished, as it often happens with ingenue. Often, mm-hmm. often you know, we, 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 it's difficult to make the transition between ingenue and leading lady, mm-hmm. uh, or leading even, even from leading lady to, you know, an older leading lady. Um, because there aren't that many roles left for them. Um, and she reinvented herself as a cabaret artist in the 70s, and that has sort of sustained her ever since. Judy Garland did the same thing, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, absolutely. Although Judy Garland was in a different category because she was a movie star. Um, um, and I suppose movie stars, you know... But nobody wanted to hire her at no, the time, so no. she went out on her own and was yes, a sensational yes. art, art cabaret, cabaret artist, cabaret artist really. Artist, yeah, yeah, big places, but it was cabaret, wasn't it? Yes, it was, it was. Although, you know, again, she also had her demons um, and, and became very unreliable in doing those, those formats. I mean, one of the key factors about cabaret, of course, is is I, th- I think it's a hugely disciplined art. I mean, I think there's, there's few arts that, arts that are as disciplined because you have to go out there and you're alone. It's you and the pianist. I mean, as long as you've got a, you, you might have a great pianist, but you have to you have to really do it. Mm-hmm. Um, in a musical, you can you can sort of you know you can you can wing it a, bit, a lot more yeah. um, and, uh, and, and and pace yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, there are very few musicals, um, evenings of musical theatre where a leading lady has to sing 14 or 15 songs in a, you know, in a row. <laughs> um, yes. um, and they do in cabaret. Um, twice nightly twice sometimes. Night, yes, absolutely. An 8 o'clock and a 10.30. Yeah. Um, so it's a hugely demanding art form and hugely underrated, actually, as a result. But a hugely rewarding one as well for the performer and for 
the audience when it's done right? When it's done right. I mean, and that's the thing, is that it's a small pool. I mean, that's the interesting thing, is that there's not that many people who can really, really do it. I mean, I've, you know, I mentioned some of the names that I think are astonishing. Uh, Barb Younger and Amanda McBroom and um, Anne Hampton Calloway. Um, but um, actually, there, there, there's... At, at, you, below the... There's probably there's probably the views of Don Mar season actually wound down after about seven or eight years. I think they were basically running out of acts. Mm. Um, mm. It, it, you know, I wasn't involved anymore, but but they but they weren't that many. It is hard now. to find people. I think for any you know, people that have got first of all a, a name with some kind of recognition because yeah. we want to you know fill the place uh, if you're producing it you don't want to be losing yeah. any money uh, and then people with that kind of recognition that can actually do it as well and do it for a modest fee because no one's going to get rich no. out of cabaret right no, no, no absolutely there's there's very little money in it i mean interestingly i i i, I... I was always resisting the big New York rooms that were high end, the high end New York rooms. I mean, you could Cafe Carlisle at the Carlisle Hotel, where Lane Stritch used to appear. Mm. Uh, you couldn't leave that room. I mean, obviously, I was used to go on press comps, thankfully. But you, if you remember the public, you wouldn't leave that room without having spent less than two hundred to three hundred dollars yeah. for your night. Yeah. And that of course, may have included a meal, but still not a very good meal. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 it seemed to me crazy money. Yeah. Um, but uh, there is a, there's now a slight more democratisation of cabaret. The the new Fifty Four Below in New York, which is a brilliant room, mm. you only have to pay a cover charge, and there's a, maybe a minimum one a one or two drink minimum. Mm. I think it's only a cover charge, though, and you can get in for twenty five dollars. Mm. So you, that's 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 fantastic. I think it's important that rooms are are, are accessible. Yes. Um, um, but then, as you say, there's not much money to pay the artist after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So there has to, which is in a sense, it's going to make sure that the people that are doing it are doing it because they for love the right it. reasons. Yeah, I know. That that you spend a lot of time in New York. How does the New York cabaret scene compare to that in London? There's rather a lot more of it because there's more rooms. Although they, they there have been some interesting departures over the last few years. The Algonquin has finally lost its room, which is, it was a great room, the, the Oak Room. Um, Fine Science is gone. Um, Rainbow and Stars was lost a few years ago, um, which is a great room at the top of Rockefeller Center. Um, however, um, having said that, I think 54 Below is now a fantastic room. I really love it. Um, and uh, it's it, it, I recently saw I remember a few weeks ago. I saw Aaron Tevert, who's a one of the he was one of the guys, the stars of the name is movie, um, and is a Broadway baby. Basically, he's done next to normal and uh, and plays shows like that on Broadway. Um, and he filled the room, absolutely packed the room up. Like he's doing a TV show, and he's big big name. Uh, I also saw um, Liz Calloway there uh, a few months ago, who's um, always astonishing. Um, so there, are, there, it's great, and that's a great room because it's in the middle of town. It's Fifty Fourth and Broadway, um, and uh, and then there's all still there's still Don't Tell Mum was on Forty Sixth Street, and there's still the small there's still a few. Is the whole rooms. cabaret culture different? Uh, because there seems to be when I've been over in New York seeing cabaret, there's the I don't know. I just get this feeling that there's more of a that the, the, the Americans, the New Yorkers particularly kind of get it a bit more than we do over here that it's kind of seems more part of their psyche to go and see uh, cabaret there is more of a community around there but then that's true of the broadway community too uh, broadway has more of a sense of community than than the west end does um and so there's much more of a network going on and also of course new york's much more compact than london i mean in london our cabaret rooms are now we've got zadell at um crazy cox at piccadilly circus we've got the pheasantry out in chelsea we've got um uh, you know they're, they're, they're separated they're all far flung far and wide in new york they're all concentrated in this little island and there's you know there's a few blocks it's a, you can get from one to the other very fast mm. um new, new york does have more but it, it's still not enough there's never enough cabaret but is there, there enough to, to satiate the demand I think that's always been the issue, is, is that it's a supply and demand business, isn't it? And, and you know, you don't want to, too much, because then, then you're dissipating the, the audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, certainly that's happened here or quite a few times. I find some nights, and I, I, or particularly Sundays, there are some times when, I, you know, somebody wants me at the Hippodrome, they want me at Crazy Cox, and they want me at um, uh, the Pheasantry, and I can't slip myself in three. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do try to get to as many as I can, but, you, but you, you know, your diary fills up. Are you optimistic about the future of Cabaret? Do you know what? I think it's going to... Uh, it, as people always want to sing, and 
there are always great singers, so I think it will always survive. Um, I think the thing that will kill it, if, if, it, if it's killed, will be the high-end approach, the, the business of charging too, way too much and overpricing it. That could kill it. But as long as it's, achieve, uh, it's accessible, I think that's what could kill the West End and Broadway too, actually, is the pricing. Because um, um, I think people don't have that sort of money. And so certainly to take that sort of chance on somebody you don't know. I mean, you know, people may pay £500, as they did last week, to see Barbara Streisand at the O2, um, but would they pay £500 for somebody they, they don't, not really sure of? They wouldn't do that. So um, I think the, the pricing is going to be the, is the key issue, and and ambiance. I mean, I think you know you, these rooms have to be have to be approachable and and and, and nice. Um, uh, Zedal, um, the Co Crazy Fox is a terrific room um, and has a real real sense of inclusiveness. Um, you know, I famously Rainbow and Stars, a room I said that was lost in New York um, at the top of Rockefeller Center. They used to have a terrible maitre d who was so uh, uh, unpleasant that I wouldn't like to go there because he was so horrible. So that's 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 a sort of um, his name was Bismarck. Um, I still remember it to this day, and. It's really important that, 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 that people are made, audiences are made to feel welcome and respected by the performers and by the house itself. But I think Cabaret will survive. I mean, I love, I, I love it and it has to survive just to say, satisfy me, if nothing else. And I can't wait to go back to Adelaide at some point. And I hope that you come back and I don't say something horrible again. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love.